the talk I'm going to give is, uh, is one that um, it's work in progress, so I'm keen to get feedback on it. So please uh, chip in at any time with suggestions or to say, oh, uh, you're missing the point here, or it'd be better if you did this rather than, rather than that. So really, I'm looking for your, for your, for your help. And it's work that I started about three or four years ago at, at Newcastle. But before I do that, just I'll say something about um, uh, what we do at Newcastle. So the first thing I was have to say in Australia, this is the other Newcastle. This is the one in the, the north of England that can cause enormous confusion, I've uh, found. And basically we try to do three things in the Digital Institute. So firstly, um, we have a research group and largely today we're working on what's become known as, as data science. And the idea is that we work with research scientists in lots of different domains. You can see some examples here from urban analytics, engineering, defense and security, and local government. And we try to find interesting problems which challenge our research. And that drives our research into the methods for how do you build systems that can extract value from vast amounts of data. Uh, and on the basis of that, we then uh, have this Center for Doctoral Training uh, where we teach uh, kids in these, uh, in the what we think are the most important tools and techniques in this in this area. So basically, we take mathematicians and computer scientists, we train them in the other subject, and we train them together, and then they do a traditional PhD where they apply the, the knowledge that they've gained to a, a real problem and a real real data. We think David and I were having a discussion about this about uh, about data science courses. So th this is our idea of how to create these uh, perfect data scientists with a skills in statistics so they've got a range of tools that they can apply to extract value from data but also they understand the computer science behind, behind how do you do that at scale either it be because you've got vast amounts of data or you've got data streaming in it with tremendous with tremendous rates and then um, we also we've always worked with industry um, but a few years ago we thought we should put this on a more systematic footing so what we've what we've done is we started with something called the Cloud Innovation Center, where we work with uh, a few a hundred companies, try to help them in that case to get their applications onto the cloud and use them to extract value from the data that was in the company. And then as a result of that, we were awarded um, about two or three years ago, the National Innovation Center for Data. I should apologize because these, these numbers are in pounds rather than Australian dollars. So roughly, if you multiply by something like three over two, or you could, if you didn't want to do that, you could wait a couple of months until after Brexit and then just switch the, <laughs> the sign up from pound to, pound to dollars. Um, so we, we do this at a large, uh, a large scale and I work a lot with, with companies. And the idea is that these are all linked together. So what we do research into drives our teaching that gives us a resource to work with companies. Some of the time we work with companies, they tell us what they want to do and we say, oh yes, you should use this because some trusted method will work. Every now and again, uh, we're sitting in a meeting with them and we think, actually, I have no idea how to do that. And I don't know anybody else who knows how to do that either. And so then that feeds back into our, and our research. And so the idea is that this uh, cycle goes round and round. Just got one picture there. This is an artist's impression. So it should be ready by the end of this year. But this is the, the, the main way in which we're working with, with companies. We've got some money to build a, a custom building for this. And the idea is we'll get companies in there and we'll work on joint projects with them. So we get the right people from the university, be their staff, PhD students, postdocs, into this building. They work with the company and then they go away again and then we run another project and we get the right people uh, in, for, in for, the, for the next project. So we're hoping to have this stream of projects with, with the industry over the next five or six years. And in general, what we find is that um, whether we're working with researchers around the university. So this is what they're trying to do. They've got all this data um, and what they want is that light bulb moment that will get them their, uh, their professorships or their Nobel Prizes or their top, uh, top ranked journal articles or, or whatever. And it's very similar when we work with, with companies. So they've got the same problem, but what they want to do is to, is to earn money from their, from their ideas. And in fact, we have to try and separate them out because what we found was in the early days when we were talking to companies, then Quite often, if we got the techie people in from the companies and, uh, and our researchers in, they would pick something that was really interesting, but would probably not add much value to the company. So now what we do, we have a method where we insist that there's some business people from the company come in, and as well as considering the technical aspects of how we extract value from the data, we 
also think about what the benefits of the company would be in terms of their bottom line. And that's how we make a decision about what projects to work with them on. And so basically this is what we what we do with the work with researchers of companies, we've got these statisticians, uh, people who know something about computing. We've got our students who thankfully are somewhere in the in the middle here, we've got all these domain experts from companies or from other academic domains. And we're looking for interesting real problems that are intersection to, to work on. Some of the things we've worked on in the in the past few years, yeah, we've worked on a huge range of projects. Um, done things like uh, we're still doing that one on the on the top left, which is about looking at oil spills, looking at satellite data, using time series analytics to try and track the progress of an oil spill, uh, and lots of issues with that, false positives, and so on are a real problem. We've done some work on uh, media analytics, Twitter analytics. Uh, we do work with energy, so trying to understand about the uses of energy in homes and in, in companies. Across the middle, increasingly, we're working with our medical school, um, so doing things with sensors. So this is a big change. In the old days, uh, I know this is driving the rest of the talk, but in the old days, medics used to deliver a swatch of data on disks and ask us to try and extract some value from it. Now it's data that's streaming out from sensors and they want to get some information in a timely fashion so as to intervene if there's a problem. So on the left, we do work on gait analysis. So putting a sensor on the backs of uh, a, a patient and monitoring how they walk. And it turns out that um, there's, a, there's a theory that we're trying to test, which is that in the early stages of dementia, uh, your walking becomes more asymmetric and you can possibly detect that by doing analysis from these sorts of accelerometers um, and Parkinson's disease as well. You can measure the progression of Parkinson's disease by looking at changes in the way people walk. Uh, we did some work on stroke rehabilitation, so using games to capture information about how people were using their, their limbs and to provide information to therapists so they could, they could target the treatment better. Um, for a while, we, we did a lot of work uh, with our transport department where we had a car that we censored up. So you censor up the car, you censor up the, the driver. This was the, uh, the, the project that David mentioned where a lot of it was focusing on older people. So how do you keep older people active for longer? Being able to drive is important for older people in rural communities. So we used to take all the people, we had a test track, uh, and then we'd take them out on the open road, capture data from them. So we put a fire belt around them to measure their heart rate, which we use as a proxy for anxiety. And all the car was instrumented to every turn of the wheel, every press of the pedal, we captured data from. And you can probably just see a slightly nervous looking researcher sitting in the, uh, in the passenger seat there. who would be there. They would drive them around the test track and then decide where they felt comfortable enough to take them out on the open road. We collected all this information uh, and you discover things such as that um, what makes all the people most anxious is things like, so, so in Australia it's easier to do this for me because you also drive on the left hand side. So it's turning right against oncoming traffic. So as you get older, you find it harder to judge speed and distances. So understanding whether that gap's big enough to get your car through, that really got people's Oh, it's racing. You didn't measure the hat rate of the passenger. It would have more interesting. It would have been, yes. Um, manufacturing. So uh, we've been doing work with Nissan, who are a local uh, car manufacturer in, in Sunderland and hopefully will be for a long time, although there's some, some issues with that at the, uh, at the moment. Uh, collecting data about faults on the production line. So one of the things that they Japanese company, they're really optimized to, to minimize faults. Um, and one of the things that happens is that any time a part is fitted, then we record information about the part, the person who did it, where it was on the production line, what the make of the, the vehicle was. And there are all sorts of rumors going around the, uh, the Nissan factory when you talk to people about what caused issues with, uh, with, with faults. So one of them was it was particular suppliers People thought that supplies uh, used to produce duct parts. Another one was that perhaps different parts of the factory were badly lit, and so that caused, caused real problems. Uh, another one was that the local uh, football team, Sunderland football team, uh, that if they lost, 
then there were more faults the, the next day. That, that was quite, a, that kept cropping up again and again. And uh, that was one that we never managed to, to nail down because if anybody knows anything about Sunderland football team, then uh, and, uh, I'm sure you all know about statistics. So in order to try and understand something, you need examples of when they won and when they lost. And basically they just <laughs> lost for the whole of the time that we were doing the experiments. It's hard to get a bit better now, but uh, we never managed to, uh, to find out whether that was true. And some work on cybercrime as well. So uh, the, the reason for this talk is this change over the last 10 years we've been doing this from people arriving with hard disks with data saying, please, can you extract some value from this, to data being streamed in and people wanting to be able to make decisions in near real time about what's what's going on, be it in a car factory because some of the stuff batch of parts come in and they want to detect that now, rather than three months later when the parts are in cars and they're, they're being driven around, or whether somebody, this is a continuous glucose monitor, whether somebody who's who's a diabetic is going to get in trouble in the next in the next few minutes or the, the next few hours. So basically what drove our research um, for the for the last 10 years, and we still use it, was we, we have a, a data analytics system which was built to deal with large amounts of data coming in. So the usual workflow, every, uh, every science uh, project has to have its own workflow language, so we had, we had ours. The data comes in, uh, something clever happens. This is, this is actually for this one. This is from the stroke rehabilitation. It took some of our statisticians about a year and a half to write the R program here, which nailed the information that we needed, which was uh, a measure of how well somebody was recovering from stroke. And then the data comes out and you produce a report and you, and you give it to somebody. And we did all the usual things about uh, trying to get this to speed up. So this is using, using Azure and getting decent speed ups when you spread the work across, across lots of nodes in the, in the cloud. So we did, we did all of that and that was, that was fine. That kept us uh, interested for, for years. But then, as I say, you get there today and more and more what you want Gosh, that's interesting that it's now put squares around people's uh, faces on there, but not on my screen. Wow, there's something uh, something interesting going on going on there. Uh, it's, rec it's recognised. So, so, um, uh, so here's a typical project that we do now. We've got we've got medics, we've got statisticians, we've got com computer scientists. What they're interested in is if you combine. Uh, accelerometry information from a, a wearable, healthcare wearable, with a continuous glucose monitoring, can you predict when somebody's going to uh, get into trouble? So these things talk for energy Bluetooth, they talk to a phone, the phone can talk to a, to a cloud. And the, there's a couple of challenges in this. One is obviously the statistical challenge of trying to extract this, uh, this prediction from it, but there's also a lot of computing challenges. And in this talk, I'll focus on the computing challenges. So this is what we, we want to do so this is the uh, activity is measured by the accelerometers this is the glucose continuous glucose monitoring and what you want to do as time goes on you want to make predictions as accurate as possible but in particular you want to predict if it's going to get above this level where it could become dangerous for the for, for the diabetic and so at this point what you want to do or as early as possible before this happens you want to be able to prompt them so from this smart watch or uh, from their phone, you want to be able to prompt them to do something like to take more exercise or to stop exercising or to eat or to, or to stop eating. Um, and so th this is the idea, can we generate a behavioral prompt? So obviously this is not something that you want to, uh, in the old days, you know, we might have collected this data or nine months later we've analyzed it and then we, we could say, oh yes, three months ago we should have told you that you should have done something different. There's a, there's a, there's a timeliness required to this, which we didn't have to, have to worry about. And so you end up building systems which uh, look something like this. So you've got your sensors, you've got a field gateway, which basically transferring the information, perhaps doing some processing from the, uh, the, the, the network protocols that the sensors use uh, through to your servers. In our case, we tend to use clouds. The data comes into some sort of a broker, and then you can do the, uh, you can do the processing. Now there's a lot of work on this, which are screen processing engines that work in the cloud. So you might have come across Storm, which, is, which came out of Twitter, 
you might have come across Spark Streaming, which came out of, out of Berkeley. These are widely used to do, to, do, to do this. And what that relies on is getting all of the data into the cloud where you can analyze it. And that's where we find increasingly that problems, problems occur. And there's three main reasons for this. So the first one is that sometimes you just don't have the bandwidth to send all of the data from the, from the sensor to the cloud for analysis. Uh, quite often you've got a reasonably low bandwidth from the sensor to say a mobile phone, and then that's talking over 4G say to a, to a cloud. Sometimes we've got, I don't know whether you've got these LoRa networks here, whether you've, you've got those around the, the city, these very low bandwidth networks that- uh, That's yeah, called the NBN. <laughs> <laughs> that, that must be your university network. Isn't it? No, it's the national. Oh, the okay. national one, okay, okay. Um, but they have the advantage of low cost, but very low bandwidth. And so that can make it impossible to do completely cloud-based analytics. The second one is that if you've got a, uh, a, a battery-powered device, then sending every single data, data item, there's a unit of energy that's expended every time you send a message, and sending every uh, unit of energy, as we'll, as we'll see later, every, every message can flatten the battery far too quickly. So that's another reason not to do that. And the second one is that if you have a high load on the cloud, so if you've got thousands or potentially millions of these, uh, these devices that are all talking to the cloud, you can generate very high loads on the cloud. And you might, the cloud's almost infinite capability, you might be able to scale up your processing, but obviously you need a credit card to use the, to use the cloud. So it might become very expensive if you're relying entirely on the cloud for all of your, all of your processing. So what we've been exploring is, um, and you can tell these slides were done by a PhD student rather than me because they're animated and look good and things flow, flow around. So what we're exploring is moving some of the processing to the field gateway and all the, the sensors, okay, in order, to avoid these, in order to avoid these problems. And the typical thing that you're trying to do is to do some sort of pre-processing data aggregation before you get to the to, to get to the cloud. And the that means that you'll reduce the number of messages so that there will be uh, less energy expended, you'll be able to cope with lower bandwidth, and there'll be less load in the, in the, in the cloud. So that's the, that's the idea. Um, and one way to do that is to, is to assemble a bright team of people and set them off to do this. So you find people who know how to program wearables and sensors, who know, to who know how to program mobile phones, who know how to program the cloud, and you get them to glue all these things, things together. You tell them what the requirements are in terms of performance, scalability, dependability, security, and so on, and you, you let them get on and do it. And this tends, and we've tried this, this, this turns out to be, to be challenging. So here's some of the, the issues that, that there are with this. The first one is the, the heterogeneity of the platforms and the networks. So if you look down here, Typically, if you're programming one of these sensors, you're, you're grubbing around at a really low level with C, and there's very small amount of computation resource available on a smartwatch and very little memory. So you really have to make the most of, uh, of the, the small resources that you, you have there. And then you've got phones, which have also have some sort of a framework uh, for, for Android phones, some sort of cut down Java, for example, that you might be able to, to use, Objective C, of course. Is a, uh, is another one, and then in the cloud you can do what on earth you want because you've got all the power of all of those all of those servers there. But in order to build an application, you need to have uh, people who know how to use all of these different tools, all these different in some cases different languages, and glue them all together to build the the application. Um, the next one is how do you partition your analytics in order to achieve your your goals? So how do you decide what runs on the on the watch, how do you decide what runs on the on the phone, what goes into the into the cloud? As we'll see, it can be quite subtle. Even for relatively small applications, you might have hundreds of different options for how you do the, the partitioning. It's very hard for humans to work out how to do that. And you're trying to do this to meet some non-functional requirements. So you're trying to meet uh, performance requirements, dependability requirements, or a healthcare wearable, it might be a problem if it falls over. Security is obviously an issue. And for battery-operated mobile devices, then uh, energy costs are a real challenge when you're trying to do this. It's very easy to come up with a partitioning 
which drains your battery very quickly because you're trying to do too much computation on the smartwatch, or it drains the battery completely very quickly because you're not doing enough when you're sending too many too many messages out. So it's that sweet spot in the middle you need to you, you need to find. Uh, okay. So two options. So one is to assemble your team of trusted developers and let them let them get on with it to 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 build a system like this. Uh, we've we've done this by hand in a, a couple of occasions, and we think it's quite hard. Uh, other people may be better at it than us, but it's certainly challenging given all the, the options and the different dimensions. But the the thing that we've tried to uh, to explore is can we automate this? Can we build a system which will automatically work out how to partition the application across these different very diverse devices in order to meet the non-functional requirements? So. In order to do this, what you need is somewhere to describe the application in a way that's amenable to automatic analysis. And this has been the, the main challenge. So here's the, the architecture of the system that we've been building over the last four, four or five years. So I'll come back to this, but this is the key. How do you describe the computation? But you need it in a high level way, it's called clear semantics, which can be understood by tools. You then got a resource catalog where you, you talk about all of the different devices and what their capabilities are. And then you've got your non-functional requirements with, for that particular application. Um, and then you've got an optimizer. So this is kind of, this is where the, the magic's supposed to happen. So you feed all of this into this magic uh, box, the optimizer. It does some logical optimization, which I'll talk about, some physical optimization, which is you'll see users' cost models. And then it feeds a deployer, which automatically pushes out the code in the right form for the different for the different devices. And we haven't got this bit working yet, but what you want to do is to have a monitor that's running all the time and make sure that you're conforming to the requirements that are being placed on you. And in order to help the optimizer, you also might want to do some some modeling and, and simulation as well. So this this is a this is probably about a 10 year endeavor to, to do all of this. And uh, as you'll see, we've done some of this bit here, and that's what I'll, I'll talk about in the rest of the rest of the talk. But the main, the main question for us was, um, how do we describe the computation? So what's a high level way to describe a computation which allows you to partition it and to optimize it? And because of uh, the things I've done over the last uh, 30 years, there's two different ways in which we, we set off to do this. So the first one, which I'll, I'll go into in more detail, was to take a relational approach. So approach based on the relational algebra. And the second one is to base it on pure functional programming, which was my uh, first love during my uh, PhD. I've never ever uh, given up on it. So we'll come on to that at the end and you'll see whether or not that's really going to cut it for these sorts of applications. Yeah, so relational. So we build a system which, which, uh, which works, works like this. We use a, a complex event processing language, I'll give you an example of this in a second, to describe the computation. So for those of you who've, uh, I guess everybody's used SQL or seen SQL, they might have seen it and run away, but you'll know the, the basic concept of, uh, of SQL. You can do selections, you can do predictions, you can join uh, uh, tables, uh, tables together. So, so all this does is to extend that with some things that are useful for working with streaming data. For example, windowing. So being able to put a time window across a set of data, like all of the, the last half hour's uh, uh, events, and do some uh, querying over, over that. So it's, been, it's a basic extension to, to what you'll come across if you use, if you use SQL. So here's one part of the algorithm that we've been using um, in, the, in, the healthcare, in the healthcare example. So basically this is measuring activity and one way to do that is to use a, a fairly straightforward step count algorithm. And so I, I won't go into enormous detail, but basically this, there's these five statements. This one here gets the data from the accelerometer. So this is a function which, which actually configures the accelerometer, so 60, for example, is 60 hertz, we want 60 samples a second. 25 tells it what data we want to, to get every, uh, uh, every time there's an event generated from it. And this feeds into something which uh, 
which works out the energy currently, it's a measure of energy. So with a traction accelerometer, you've got uh, three axes, and as you swing your arm, as you, as you walk, these register in different ways. And one way to combine them all together and a measure of how much activity there is, is to what you do is you square the, the values that you get from each axis, and then you take the, the square root of that to give you a, a, a to give you the a, a single a single value. Um, and then the next one, so this is comparing two different uh, two different values from here, and if they're different by a particular threshold, then it says, oh yes, there's a step occurs. So it's looking for a change which is like going from that to going to going like that. And then down here, what this is doing is effectively to generate step events. And this is going to, uh, just on this crack in the screen, 120 second window. So it's going to look for two minutes worth of these step events and it's going to count them up. And then this is what it produces. So it's, it, it's working out how many events there are every, every two minutes. And it's using that as a measure of the activity level of the, uh, of the wearer. This is, if you've got a Fitbit, it's roughly this sort of thing that's going on in a, in a Fitbit. Although somebody there will have coded it in C rather than in this. Uh, in, in, in this sort of language. But once you've got that, then you can turn that into a graph of operation. So it maps uh, pretty much uh, straightforwardly. So you get the data, there's actually, I, I didn't mention this, but you have to check uh, here that the accelerometer is on, which is this, this check here. And then uh, the calculation of, the, of how much energy somebody's expending is, is done through these projects. And then you've, you've got this uh, square root, and then you do this check whether a step's occurred, and here's a 120 second window, and then you do a count. And then in this case, we're just putting the result into a, into a database. In the, in the real example, we combine it with information uh, from the continuous glucose monitor. But I've simplified it for the purposes of this talk. Okay, so the next thing that we can do is, now we've got that representation, we can do some logical optimization. So anybody who's, who's done uh, uh, database server implementation 101 uh, will know that there's all of these ways to optimize uh, relational algebra expressions. So some classic ones are, if you're going to, if at some point you do a select, so basically that's filtering out data that you, you don't need anymore, you try to do that as early as possible. So rather than have data that goes all the way through the system and then you throw it out, you get rid of it as soon as possible. Projects are about getting rid of fields within the data as soon as possible as well. Why store, why transmit through our system data that you're never going to actually use? So you, you have the logic of the optimizer can apply these transformations and that reduces the amount of load uh, in the terms of the computation, but can actually also reduce the amount of data that's transmitted over the networks. And then once we've done that, we have to work out where we're going to place all those operators. So you saw all those, uh, that graph of operators, where do they go? Do they go on the watch? Do they go on the phone? Do they go on the, on the cloud? And it turns out that once you've worked out all possibilities, then there's 225 different ways to do that. So this is one of the reasons we think it's hard for humans to, uh, to, to be able to get the, get the right answer. There's, there's a lot of uh, different options, even for quite simple applications and so the first thing that you do is we have to remove some that just aren't possible because of the limitations of the devices so you can't do everything on a smartwatch that you can do in the cloud there's some operations where it needs capabilities that are beyond what the simple devices can do so you knock out those as, as options and once we did that we were still left with 18 different plans that we could have So how do you decide between these, these plans? Well, you have to have some measure of, uh, of which is the, the best one. And we've been playing around with different cost models. The one I thought I'd talk about, because uh, I think it's most interesting to me, is a cost model based on energy usage. So um, until about six or seven years ago, the only sort of optimizations I'd ever done were, were things like improving the performance by reducing the computation time, maybe reducing the amount of disks that a program uh, required to use. But increasingly in this new world of mobile devices, mobile sensors, then energy is the limiting factor. You don't want your healthcare smartwatch, which is supposed to be prompting somebody if they're about to get into trouble, 
you don't want to run out of battery after a couple of hours. So this is the, I'll, I'll talk about one cost model. We've got more than, more than just energy, but this is the one I'll focus on. So the first thing that we had to do was to come up with some way of computing the energy cost of a particular deployment. And uh, there's a paper which goes into this in enormous detail from Cloudcom from a couple of years ago, if you want to know the, the details, but I'll just summarize it. So the operating system is using energy all the time. So you have to take that into account. You've then got the, the cost of the operators which you've chosen to put on a particular, particular device. And then this is all about the network costs. So these are significant costs. So this is about the number of messages that are going to be sent multiplied by the cost of a message. And then as we'll see, there's a complication with lots of network systems like low energy Bluetooth, because they're not just incurring an energy cost for every message, there's also a cost that, uh, that you incur at other times. I'll show you, I'll show you that on the next, on the next slide. So this is, this is what my, uh, one of my PhD students, Peter Michalak, who's done a lot of this work, has spent uh, quite a lot of the last year or two doing. So he sits at his desk, um, he takes out uh, portable devices, he plugs them into a, a power monitor, and quite often he blows them up actually, so then we have to go on eBay and try to buy, uh, buy, buy more of them. We've gone through, I can't tell you how many Pebble watches we've gone through in the course of this, uh, uh, of this research. And then he, he deploys operators uh, on, the, on the watch, and he measures their energy usage, and he also does the same thing for the transmission of, of messages. So he's basically calibrating this model based on running different operators through many times, taking an average, and then plugging those numbers into the, into the cost model. And I said that uh, the complication, one of the complications was, was uh, networking, and it, and it is. So you can see this is what happens with low energy Bluetooth. So when you want to send a message, the system will fire up the low energy Bluetooth system, so it's incurring energy as it, as it uh, switches on its transmitter. And then here, here's when it's actually transmitting the, the message you've asked it to send. And then um, in order to, the way in which these, these things are, uh, are set up, in order to avoid this startup cost every time, the system has a kind of hysteresis. It thinks, oh, well, he's just sent some messages. Maybe we're going to have to send some more, so I won't actually switch it off at the moment. I'll just keep it in this quiescent state, ready to go. But after a while, it gives up because there's no more messages being sent. And so you get down to just the, the idle time of the, of the operating system. And then the same thing happens again the next time you send a message. So you have to take this into account in the, in the cost model. And in the end, you end up uh, with a system where once you've chosen which is the right cost model, then what uh, we can do is automatically deploy the cheapest um, deployment um, partitioning on all of the different devices we have. So it puts some uh, of the code on the smartwatch, it puts some of it on, in some cases, on the phone, and it puts some of it on the, on, on the cloud. And there's a soup of different sorts of technologies that we use in order to, order to do this, which again leads me to think that expecting a human to do this uh, would, would would be very, very challenging. So let's have a look at the results just to see whether it does anything useful at all. So I, I said that there were 18 different plans and here, here they are. So this is, this is all of them. And you can see for each one, this is the energy impact, which translates into the battery life of the, uh, of the smartwatch. And you can see that most of them are up, are up here, um, which are quite expensive in, in terms of energy. But there's a, there's a couple in the middle, and then there's a couple that are, that are much cheaper. And so these are the ones that we actually, um, uh, we actually use in practice. So in fact, this one here, this is 5.87, whereas some of these ones are 27 something. So it's a, it's, a, it's a major change. And so what's going on? So this is saying what's going on on the watch. In this case, um, this was before we'd managed to calibrate computations on the phone. So we're just using the phone as a as a gateway to the cloud, and this is what's going on in the, on the cloud. Now, the one thing I like about this, so this is the cheapest one, and basically what's happening is it's doing some processing which reduces the total amount of data that needs to be sent. So it's doing that 
uh, the computation of squaring the three axes of the accelerometer and adding those, those together. And then it's doing some windowing. So windowing, uh, you use as much of the memory as you have got in the smartwatch and you store events in there and then you send them all in one big message and that dramatically reduces the amount of energy when compared to this one which is the one where you just get the reading from the uh from the the, the accelerometer and then you immediately send it to the cloud for, for processing so reducing the amount of data and packaging it into larger messages really really works and the thing i like about this one versus that one is because we were quite surprised because uh, this did better than us. So we didn't think about this one. What it actually does is that um, it squares the, acceler the axes, the values from the axis accelerometer. It adds them together so you get a single integer. Um, but it doesn't do the square root until you get to the cloud. So we'd always thought of that bit as being one package of arithmetic that you would do on the, on the phone. But actually, you squeeze a little bit of uh, of energy away from the, the smartwatch if you move the square root over to the, to the cloud. And we, did, we didn't think about, think about that, but the optimizer came up with that as the optimal, optimal solution. Okay, and uh, does it make any difference? Well, we've got about a four and a half times battery life improvement by doing this compared to the, uh, the, the alternative of sending everything to the, to the cloud. And in some cases, of course, you might be paying for your data that's being sent, or you might have limited bandwidth. So it's a three times uh, bandwidth reduction between the wearable and the, and the cloud. And, so, and this, was, this was all done by feeding in to the cost model, the basic parameters of the cost of the, the basic operations, and then pressing a button and getting it to work out all of the different options and choosing the, choosing the best one. This, one. this one up here. So, that's kind of kind of works, um, but there's some issues with it. So, um, so relational algebra has limited uh, express expressivity. I shouldn't have put that on a slide. Should it? it's not a very good good word. You can't. It's hard to write rich applications just using the relational algebra. And so, what you end up with is defining uh, these user defined functions, which are you can do whatever you want. You, you tell the, the system, here's a, here's a user-defined function, include that in the processing. But the problem is that the optimizer doesn't know what's going on. Uh, it, it has no knowledge of the, of the operations, which makes it very difficult for it to, uh, to work out what the cost would be on any particular uh, uh, platform that you deployed it on, unless you ask the programmer to, to tell you that. And that's what we were trying to, to avoid. Uh, so it doesn't know how to optimize it. It's hard to work out a, a cost for it. And that's because of the, uh, the limited expressibility. So here's what we uh, haven't got as much detail on this because this is at an earlier stage. But just to end, this is some early results from another alternative, which is pure functional program. So as I say, um, uh, when I started my PhD, it was on functional program in the early, in the early uh, 80s. And uh, I've, I've carried the flame of functional programming for all of these years, even though I haven't been able to, uh, uh, to use it all the, all the time. Um, I should, David mentioned about uh, me working in Manchester and on some of the Alvi projects. They were all in collaboration with a, uh, a now defunct British computer company called ICL. Some people still remember, still remember ICL. Um, and when the key people in the project from ICL um, got a slot with their board to talk to them about this project and to say, uh, look, we've managed to build a parallel machine, it's got 64 nodes and it can parallelize functional programs and look, you get these nice straight line graphs. Then uh, the main feedback they got was, well, that's really interesting, but we don't have a single customer who writes functional programs, so why is it any use to, uh, any use to us? And uh, so since that time, I've still been predicting, and uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm... Uh, I don't think I'm wrong because I stick with my prediction that within, within 10 years, functional programming will be the main way in which people write, write programs. And I've been, I've been saying that since about 1982. So, uh, so uh, I, I feel I've stuck to my, to my guns with that one. Um, so, so what do we do? So basically, what you need is a set of things, a set of ways to build uh, these event processing systems 
that you can reason about. And so uh, we fiddle around for, for a few years trying to come up with a, a small set. And the idea was they should be expressive. Uh, we should have the smallest set possible that would be required to build, uh, to build systems. And the key thing is that well understood semantics. So optimizers, cost models and so on would be able to work on them. And so you end up with, uh, those of you who have done functional programming will, well, there's so filters which are basically just deciding whether an event should be chucked out or whether it should continue. Um, there's, all, there's two forms of these because this one just looks at individual event, whereas this one has some state that's passed from event to, to event. Uh, map, which is where you apply a function to each event uh, to do some, uh, some manipulation of it. And this, is the, uh, this is the version with some state for that. And then you've got a way to do windows and the dual of windows, which is to expand out the uh, a window in individual events. And then you've got ways to combine, so combine streams which are of the same type, but also to combine streams which are of different types. So we, um, we've written quite a few example programs to, to check that this is uh, expressive. And um, if I, in fact, if I go to... Uh, this, so this is one of the major examples. So for anybody working on stream processing, I would thoroughly recommend the ACM, this is the main event processing conference. They have a challenge every year. And so they give you some data. And in 2015, it was New York taxi cab logs. And then they give you some uh, challenges about the information they want to get from it. Um, and this is the log information that you get. So you've got a unique ID at the top. I won't go through all of this, but you can see you've got when they pick up a, a customer, you've got the longitude and latitude. When they drop it off, you get the longitude and latitude, and you find out what the, what the fare is. So you can start to do an analysis about which are the most popular routes, which are the most profitable routes. And the challenge, so this is one of the two parts of the, parts of the challenge, which was to find the most frequent routes at any time and to alert you when the most frequent route, route changes. Um, and, it, and it does this over, I won't go through all of this, but here's the window for half an hour. So it's interesting, half an hour windows, popular routes over a course of half an hour. And so what you end up doing in this functional programming world is that you take the data that you, uh, in the form that I, that I showed earlier, you have to turn the longitudes into grids because the, 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 the ACM challenge talks about not just doing it for individual latitudes and longitudes, but for dropping a grid down over Manhattan and for saying which is the most popular cell uh, journey from one cell to another. So you filter out anything which is out of range for the competition. Uh, you then do a sliding window for half an hour, as I've said, and then you do a top K, which works out, uh, which is the, 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 ten, the most, 10 most popular routes. And then this, what this does is to filter out any events from here which are exactly the same as the last one because you're only interested in changes you're interested when there's a new uh, there's a new set of popular routes so that so that that challenge to me drops out very simply into uh into these set of functions i have been writing function functional programs for about 30 years though so uh if you haven't then you'll have to take my my word for it that once you've got your functional programming head on it's fairly straightforward to turn the, the application into a small set of functions like this and so just to show what uh, one of the things we can do here. Um, so again, another, another example of semantics, because we, can, we know quite a lot about all of these functions, we can predict for a given input message rate what the output message rate is. So the input rate is R. Uh, so, um, so, so it's just uh, for a filter, this depends on the selectivity of a filter to have what proportion of, of events are thrown out. If it's a map, then every event that comes in uh, goes out. Windowing again uh, changes the number of events by combining them, expand as the reverse, uh, and so on. So it's quite easy to take an example like this and to start to build a performance model relatively automatically. So uh, what you have to tell it is you tell it what the input rate is for the events. You tell it about the the average service time for each of these. Uh, each of these processing steps and the selectivity when it's, a, it's some sort of a filter. And then it's quite easy to automatically generate a, a, a queuing theory network. So this is a, a, a network of queuing theory networks, so Jackson, uh, a Jackson network. And 
it tells you useful things. So when I did this, for example, which we're about to deploy, then it told me that actually this isn't going to work because this is uh, operation four is, un is unstable. So it's not going to process the events fast enough. And so eventually the input queue is going to grow and grow and grow and all, it'll all blow up. So um, the reason for showing that is just to show that if you restrict yourself in particular ways to the way in which you describe the problem, then you can start to automatically build tooling, which will help you to understand whether or not a particular deployment is going to work. And we've seen that with the, the relational example where that was all based on optimizing energy. But you can also see that in the functional world as well, we also get some nice properties that we can exploit, like being able to predict the, the performance behavior. Okay, so uh, just to, to, to end, so this is where we're, where we're at really. Um, we can compile, we compile a stream graph to dot the containers because that's what you have to do uh, these days. Um, it's actually quite, quite useful because it makes it easy to manage and, de and deploy them. It means we can get down to Raspberry Pis. We can't get down to smartwatches with Docker containers. I think we're a while off from, uh, from being, able to, being able to do that. Um, we can automatically parallelize some of the operators. So again, because we understand the semantics, we know that the maps, for example, we can always parallelize those. And we've been playing around with uh, Kubernetes, which is, as you know, is a way to scale out uh, Docker containers. Uh, and also serverless, because uh, that's something that's cropped up in the last couple of years, which we think is going to be uh, important and interesting. There's a few problems uh, using those at the moment, so we're mainly on the Kubernetes uh, front at the moment. And we've also started work about adding security and crash tolerance into the system automatically. So, so to, to think about what we've learned from this five or six years of exploring these two tracks with the relational and with the, the functional, uh, and also trying to do it by hand, uh, I think um, you only have to look at all of the disasters that have befallen um, systems that have been written by humans where information's leaked or they've failed uh, thermometers in people's, people's homes, for example, I guess air conditioning controllers here might be a, might be a better example, but they, they break down every, every now and again because some part of the system just uh, hasn't been designed properly. And so even big companies are struggling to, to do this. So our idea is, question is, can we use these declarative languages like relational or functional to automate the process and reduce some of these, some of these risks? And the key challenge in all of this is between uh, how expressive the, the, language, the language is and how simple the semantics are. If you, if you make the system more and more expressive so you can do whatever you want, then it's very hard to reason about it. If you restrict the, how expressive the, the, the system is, then the semantics are simple, but it limits the applications that you can uh, that you can represent. And we saw that with the relational approach, where we ended up putting more and more of our effort into these opaque user-defined functions that the optimizer could cope with. So we're still looking for this sort of Goldilocks somewhere in the middle between the, these two uh, these two positions, and we'll keep exploring it. Thank you.